All right. Oh, it wants to go live. Thinking about it. The exciting button pressing part of the presentation. There we go. All right. So good morning, everyone. Afternoon, depending on where you're joining from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited today because we are continuing a <laughs> oh, I'm in twice somehow or other. That's exciting. Uh, sorry. So <laughs> terrible internet, guys. It keeps cutting out. I'm going to skip the intro. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Christine Dow. We're joined by her. Uh, she's at U Waterloo in uh, Ontario, just about an hour from me in Toronto. We're joined uh, as part of the Arctic Institute of North America. Amazing series of programs programs. We've done, I think, five programs of them so far, many more to come. We're going to dive in with incredible Arctic stories. And so Dr. Dow is going to talk to us today about her role as a glaciologist exploring the farthest reaches of the globe. So without further ado, I'm going to take us away with your presentation. You okay. should be set. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Yes, well, hopefully my internet uh, lasts for the next hour or so as well. Um, I will introduce myself. My name is Dr. Christine Dow. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo, and my title is glaciologist. So what I thought I would do to start off with is tell you a little bit about what a glaciologist actually is. So as a glaciologist, I'm interested in any type of ice that is flowing over the land and, and sometimes into the ocean. So this counts glaciers flowing through valleys. This counts ice sheets that are forming um, above large areas of land. And so here I'm showing a video of um, a helicopter flying over an ice shelf in the Antarctic. Now this is when glaciers have managed to get to the ocean and then they start floating. So it's a bit like when you have an ice cube in your glass that it's floating on the top of the liquid. It's the same with glacial ice. So if you were a very good diver, you could dive underneath this ice shelf. It's about 200 meters deep, so you might have a bit of trouble, um, but we can certainly send robots down there. But you could go underneath in the ocean and have a look at what's above you. Now you can see all of these cracks in the edge of the ice shelf. And this is really, really interesting to us because we want to know what is causing these ice shelves to break up. And we want to know if the ocean, which you can see on the right, or the atmosphere is playing a role in that. So. The main interesting things that I'm, I'm looking at as a glaciologist are trying to figure out what makes glaciers and ice sheets move. Now, you might think of glaciers as pretty slow plodding um, materials, but actually some of them move quite fast. You could sit and watch one move past you um, in a day. I mean, it might only move a few meters, but it's still moving maybe a bit, little bit faster than you realize. Now, depending on the conditions, glaciers can flow either faster or slower. And the faster they flow down towards the ocean, the more global sea level rise we're going to have. So we really want to know what controls that and what controls that speed. And of course, as we all know, things are getting warmer. We know that the ocean is getting warmer. We know that the atmosphere is getting warmer. And so we want to know with those changes how that is going to affect glaciers as well. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen graphs like this before. On the left, we've got temperature. And what that's showing is that, you know, it was fairly stable. But as of 1980, it started ramping up very, very, very rapidly. And if we look at the red box here, if we zoom in in there, we can have a look at what's happening with global sea level rise. So this is from about 1995 to today. And we can see that it's increasing very, very rapidly as well. This shouldn't be happening. This is all to do with the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. The reason that the sea level rises is partly because the ocean is getting a bit warmer and so it expands, but also because the glaciers are melting faster and faster. And so why we care about glaciers, we want to know how they're going to do in our warming planet and we want to know how that's affecting sea level rise. Now, this is a video. We'll see if I can play this. Um, this is it's very um, home video uh, showing the front of a glacier in Greenland that's breaking off. So you can see it all crumbling at the edge here and then a large piece popping up at the side. Now, this is this is called a calving procedure. So the glacier calves off the front and all of this ice that's gone into the ocean is going to add to sea level rise. 
Now you might not be able to tell, but this is several hundred meters long. There's a lot of water or a lot of ice underneath the water level. And you can just see it crumbling here. And this is happening more and more frequently due to climate change. So we want to know how that's going to increase in the future and exactly what causes that to happen. So that's the serious reason that we're interested in glaciers. Like we want to know how climate change is affecting them. We want to know if they're going to survive in the future and how long they have left. But there are some other reasons. And personally, one of the reasons I love working on glaciers is because they're spectacular places to be. They're absolutely beautiful environments. This is one of my favorite photos that I'm showing you right now. And it's showing ice that's just essentially dripping off every single surface that you can see. And as a glaciologist, that's the best view that I can possibly have. It's so quiet and peaceful and you can just sit and enjoy the amazing scenery around you. We have a lot of different environments of ice. You know, we have mountains, we've got ocean, we've got these amazing cracked up areas as ice is flowing into the ocean. You wouldn't want to go for a walk here. It's not very safe, but if you're on the edge of the ice, you can have a very good view of, of the spectacular scenery around you. So a lot of us work in this area because it is beautiful and we're very, very lucky to go to these remote places and see it in person. There are some other advantages. You get quite a lot of cute animals associated uh, with glaciers and ice sheets as well. And I'm sure you all know that you do not have penguins and polar bears in the same place. Your penguins are in the Antarctic and your polar bears are in the Arctic. Despite what all the Christmas cards tell you, they're definitely in separate parts of the world. But my goodness, aren't they cute? I mean, look at this little guy down here. These are a baby emperor penguin. They were absolutely adorable. We have baby Weddell seals yawning on the ice. And then, of course, the polar bears in the Arctic. Now, you don't want to get very close to these guys. They can be pretty dangerous. But from a distance, they're spectacular creatures to observe and to look at. So these are just some of the advantages of being a glaciologist, being able to see these amazing sights around the world. Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you to two different places that I work. We're going to go first to the Antarctic and then we're going to go to the Yukon. And I'm researching very, very different things in both of these areas, but they're both very, very important for figuring out how glaciers are responding to climate change. So this is where I am right now. I'm in Waterloo. It's snowing. It's cold. What a better time to go and visit the Antarctic. And of course, for that, we have to go south. So technically, when you're going down there, you go via Christchurch in New Zealand but you end up in the Antarctic here. And so if uh, you follow this little red arrow here, this is where I've been working in the Antarctic in Terra Nova Bay. This is uh, where the plane lands. So you fly from New Zealand all the way to the Antarctic and it lands on the sea ice. So of course that means you can't go all times of year because the sea ice isn't always there. So you've got to be very careful. There's enough ice to hold the plane when it lands. So you can't always land there. And this is the South Korean Jangbogo station that I stayed at. And from there, we took helicopters every day and we flew over to this ice shelf, the Nansen ice shelf. And that's the same one that I was showing you the photo um, at the very, very beginning of the presentation. So in terms of the work on the ice shelf, what I was doing was dragging this um, instrument. This is a radar. And what it's doing is it's pinging energy through the ice shelf. So here's the top of the ice shelf pinging it all the way down to where the ice is lying on top of the ocean, is floating, and bringing it back up again. So what that tells us is how thick the ice is. You can see this beautiful boundary between the ice shelf and the ocean beneath it. And so in order to get as much data as possible, you have to walk as far as you can. And in this case, we walked 88 kilometers over this ice shelf, not in one day, luckily. Now, what you probably can't tell from here is that, you know, it's important work for science, it's beautiful, but my goodness, is it cold. So this area at the back of the photo is, um, is the Antarctic ice sheet and you have catabatic winds, these extremely cold, fast winds blowing down this ridge onto the ice shelf. And it is cold, it is minus 25, you've got wind blowing in your face, it's unpleasant. So anytime we were walking in this direction, not very much fun, but as soon as you turn around and walk in the other direction, life gets a lot better. And you can see this is me here quite bundled up against the cold um, next to this instrument. We were measuring how fast the ice shelf is going as well. So that's what it's like working in the Antarctic. Spectacular, but pretty chilly. Now, the reason that we're particularly interested in these floating areas is something called the ice shelf safety band. So if you have a look at this picture on the right, 
um, all of the areas that are colored are ice shelves. So these are areas of ice that are floating on the ocean that are attached to the ice on the land. And all the gray areas is the ice on the land. Now, what these ice shells are doing is they're acting a bit like a belt. They're holding back that ice on the land. And if you loosen that belt, or if you make it less stable, then that ice on the land can flow faster and faster into the ocean. So anything that causes these colored floating areas to, to break up or to melt a bit or to get thinner means that we have more and more uh, land ice going to the ocean and more and more sea level rise. A good example is it's like a cork in a bottle. So if you take the cork out the bottle, the liquid flows out. It's the same with the ice in the interior. If you get rid of the, the ice shells, it's removing the cork from the bottle. Now, the problem is that we're having a lot of changes in the Antarctic right now. On the left-hand side here, what you're seeing is a diagram of the ocean temperatures. And anywhere in red is bad. That means that the ocean is warming up. And as we know, when ice gets warmer or the ocean gets warmer, ice is going to melt a lot faster. And in fact, we see that exactly. So everywhere you see our red area of ocean here, we've got big red blobs in this picture. And that means that those ice shelves, those protective barriers against sea level rise are getting thinner and thinner over time. And this is really, really worrying because it means that we're going to have more and more sea level rise in the future as these get weaker. So what this means is the cork is already coming out of the bottle and we just have to figure out how fast that's going to happen in the future and if there's anything we can do about it. Now, the only way to see into the future is to use models. We can't actually know 100% what's going to happen. And so we use our best physics, our best computing resources to try and find out what's going to happen in the future. Now, if we take the middle scenario here, so these different scenarios depend on how well we do at reducing our greenhouse gases. If we were in the first, uh, the first bubble on the left here, we'd be doing very well, but we're already past that point. So the best scenario we're really looking at is this one in the middle, and that is still going to give us five meters of sea level rise by 2,500. It's not really that long away, and that is a lot of sea level rise. By this point, you've already flooded most of Vancouver, Miami, New York, and many, many, many cities around the world. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, our track is on this right-hand one here. This is what we're doing right now. And if we keep on on the track we're going, that's going to be 12 meters of sea level rise by 2,500. That is an astonishing amount. And you see how much of the Antarctic has been lost, including the area that I'm working at. It would be entirely gone in a few hundred years' time. So this is something we really need to try and work towards reducing the likelihood of this happening and trying to get as close to the bubble on the left as we possibly can. Otherwise, we're going to have extreme change across the entire globe. OK, so on that serious note, I'm going to take you back to Waterloo. And this time, instead of going south, we're going to go up to the Yukon here. So this is my, my second site in Canada that I work in. And it's quite different from the Antarctic. So instead of being ice floating in the ocean, instead what we're looking at is a glacier flowing through a valley. So this is Lowell Glacier or Naladay Glacier in the, the local language. And we're interested in what makes this glacier move. So that's back to that original question that I was, I was introducing at the very beginning. And in order to figure that out, we put a lot of instruments out and um, we get to fly around in helicopters and we get to see the local sites as well. And so, just like in the Antarctic, it's a very spectacular place. I mean, this is just beautiful, the amount of ice up there, these mountains. I'm so, so lucky to be able to do this as part of my job. And so it's it's different environment from the Antarctic, but in my opinion, anywhere you have ice is going to be pretty spectacular. We also have animals up in the, the Yukon as well. They're a little bit different from the ones in the Antarctic. Uh, what happened in this case was we have these cameras, they're called spy cams, and we set them up to record on the glacier um, a picture every hour. So this is actually up above the glacier on a rock in the middle of nowhere. So they're supposed to record a picture every hour so we can see how the ice is moving over time. But this year I accidentally set the camera um, for animal capture. So it's really for for um, hunting spy cams that this is originally for. And we managed to capture this uh, ghost goat that turned up at one point and um, scared us a little bit when we were looking through the pictures. We also turned out there was a bird that decided to nest on the camera. So we've got about 50 pictures of a bird's butt instead of the glacier, which 
you know, it's kind of funny. It would have been nice to get the glacier pictures, but this is one of my favorite um, field photos from around here is this terrifying looking Muppet goat. Okay, so working in the Arctic is a little bit different. It's not quite as cold a lot of the time, so you can see we're not quite as bundled up here. We can set up weather stations to record what the weather's doing. We do a lot of helicoptering around. There are disadvantages though. The reason I have my hood up here is because the number of mosquitoes is just incredible. It was horrifying how many bugs there were at the side of the glacier here. So we were trying to shelter for them as we we're setting up this camera to look at the glacier over here. Now work is still hard. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. If you're camping on the ice, which we sometimes do, occasionally, you know, it's a good idea to take a nap. And so that's what's happening down here. You learn how to sleep in the most uncomfortable positions when you can, when you're working in these environments. Okay, so here's a picture of the glacier. If you're looking up glaciers, so this is the lake at the front of Lowell Glacier. We've got four cameras pointing at the side. You know, they're quite steep slopes here. They're a bit difficult to get to, but luckily our helicopter can drop us up there. And they're looking down at the glacier so we can get some 3D um, images of how that ice is changing. Our GPS stations are measuring how fast the ice is flowing. Our weather station, which I showed you the picture of, is telling us about the temperature and how that's changing over time. And then what I'm gonna be showing you data from is our drilling site, which happened um, a year ago, we managed to drill through the ice. And I'll show you a little bit about how we went about that. Okay, now it all sounds quite glamorous, but it, you know, it doesn't always go that smoothly. We did manage to get um, some people up this summer to collect data, and it was a good thing we did because we had a lot of problems. So some of the other local wildlife bears like to uh, chew on our cameras. So this is a time-lapse camera, supposed to be looking down here on the glacier, but a bear has knocked it over and broken the tripod. Another one, which I don't have a picture of, unfortunately, the bear had managed to snap off a tripod leg, throw it down the mountain, rips the lid off the camera, turned the camera off, which I thought was quite impressive for a bear, and then left it out all winter. And remarkably, our Nikon camera still works. It's incredible. It sat out there in the snow and the rain and it still takes pictures. Not of anything useful, but you know, it was just taking pictures of the ground up until the bear turned it off. So, you know, we have our fair share of problems with wildlife. Nature causes problems too. We had a lightning strike on our weather station. So this is an instrument that measures how much sunlight is coming in and how much energy is leaving. It's pretty important for our work, but lightning, lightning fried it. So it, it melted the wires inside of here, which then went inside the logger box and melted some other stuff. So that was fun to have to deal with. Um, things fall over quite a lot. This is supposed to be measuring the ice velocity and instead it's, you know, just having a nap apparently on the surface of the glacier. Um, so it's a good thing we managed to get back this summer and turn it up again. And probably my favorite thing that went wrong this summer is this logger box. So what's happened here is there's a boulder that has rolled down the glacier, knocked the logger over and started dragging it into a giant hole in the glacier. So we're really lucky to be able to get it back at all. But needless to say, it wasn't doing very much use at that point in time, having been run over by a boulder. So just to demonstrate, when you're dealing with nature, when you're dealing with these harsh environments, not everything goes well all the time. Even though I can show you many, many pretty photos, there's you know sometimes quite a lot of stress involved in this as well. Now, in terms of what we're looking at in the Yukon, it's important to know that a lot of glaciers aren't that cold. So here you'll see water on the surface. So this is sunlight coming in, melting the surface. If you're a bit crazy, you sometimes go down these, these moulins, they're called, big holes in the ice. We get rivers forming on the surface. We have big lakes forming. And then here's just a video showing you the water flowing into this moulin. Now these things terrify me. These go right into the very center of the ice. This is actually um, images in a video from Greenland. And this water that you can see here is going through a kilometer of ice to the base. And when it reaches the base of the ice, it doesn't freeze. It actually flows underneath the ice, between the ice and the rock, all the way to the edge. So you can see in the very distance in this photo here, there are some mountains. That's the edge of the ice sheet. It's about 70 kilometers away. And so that water can flow as liquid for 70 kilometers underneath the ice. And we've discovered that that's super important for how glaciers move. 
Now, when this water gets to the bottom of the ice, it can do some pretty spectacular things. And it can carve out these massive, massive channels that you see here. Again, not advisable to really go in here. It's a bit dangerous, things could collapse. But if you're, you know, if you're a caver or if you're you're this way inclined, you can crawl into these channels and have a look. And you'll see they're they're really big. This is a lot of water that's come down, swirling around, melted these big channels out and made its way to the edge of the ice. However, it doesn't always carve channels. Sometimes the water spreads out instead. And this is an example here from Iceland, when a volcano has erupted, melted the underneath of the ice that's sitting over the top of the volcano. And because there's so much water, it's, it's too much to, to really carve a channel in time. And so instead that water spreads out and flows down the glacier. And when it does that, it's acting as a lubricant. It's essentially lifting the ice up, very high pressure, and the ice has no longer got any friction, so it just shoots forward. And you see these pictures here. Anywhere you see red is where the ice is flowing a lot faster than normal. And over on the left-hand side, that's where the, the volcanic eruption started. And so you see that you're melting underneath the ice, start speeding it up, and then this propagates all the way through the glacier. This spreads under the ice and starts allowing the whole ice to move very fast. And that's why water is really, really important. And it's really important that we figure out whether it's carving channels or whether it's spreading out in terms of why our glaciers are moving quickly. Now, in terms of the Yukon Glacier site, we want to know. We want to know what the water is doing. We want to know how, it, how it's operating in the bed. And so to do that, we use my brand new toy, which is a hot water borehole drill. And over on the left here, you see two burners, diesel burners, that can heat water up to 85 degrees. That's almost boiling. So it's really, really hot water. You don't want to stick your hand anywhere near this. It then gets into a really, really high pressure. That water is fed through 400 meters of hose. And that hot pressure water is then pointed towards the ice. And you blast and melt a hole down through 400 meters of ice. And at that point, you have direct access to the glacier bed. And that's how we find out about water in the Yukon. I'll show you what this looks like. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a little slow going. It's not the most dramatic thing in the world. It takes maybe eight hours to drill about 400 meters. So you spend a lot of time watching this video go by. Oh, there's me. I'm wearing my, my ear protection because these drills are very noisy. I never pretended that it was a glamorous life uh, being a glaciologist, but um, this is one of the, the most fun things to do on a glacier is to drill boreholes and get access to these really remote parts of the ice. Okay, so once we've drilled the borehole, this is what it looks like. You've got this 15 centimeter hole all the way through the ice, and we wanna find out what it looks like. So we stick a camera down and we can see what the interior of the ice looks like. And the further down this camera goes, the further back in history we're going. So we can see how the ice formed, how it's cracked over time, how it's evolved. And so this is really, really valuable for figuring out how the ice is changing. Um, once the camera work is done, we can then put instruments down. This is me on the right, about to install some instruments. So this is recording temperature of the ice. We're recording the pressure of the water, so how easy it is for that water to lift the ice up and down. And we're recording um, conductivity, which tells you whether water is flowing through sediment or flowing over rock. And so these are all super important things for us to be able to tell how water is affecting the speed of the glacier. So in terms of some data, this is, um, this is from the first ever borehole I drilled. And what this graph is showing you is how high water is in that hole that we drilled. So anytime you see a yellow area is during the day and otherwise it's during the night. And what this is showing you is as the sun hits the ice, it melts the surface that makes its way to the bed through one of those moulins, through one of those holes. And then it fills the subglacial system up with water. And as it's doing that, the water in the borehole rises. And then overnight, you don't have melt because you don't have sunshine. And so the water level drops as that water drains out of the system. Now, bizarrely, for my first ever borehole, I managed to actually hit one of these channels. And the reason we know this is because these water levels are actually quite low. Normally, if you're not in a channel, these would be much, much higher. And so this happens maybe once in a career. It's like hitting a needle in a haystack. It's really, really difficult to do. And I managed it on my first borehole and I probably never will again. So it's a good thing that we got some very, very nice data showing us how 
pressure in the system is rising and falling every day. And we can analyze how this changes over the season and over years as well. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that these areas are special. They're special in that they're, they're giving us an indication of how the world is changing. They're special because they're absolutely spectacular, beautiful places, regardless of whether you're in the Antarctic or in the Yukon. We want to be able to preserve these for future generations. And I want other people to be able to see these as well in the future. And so it's really important to think of this when we're trying to figure out how to move forward as a society. The last photo I'm going to show you is, I'm not going to tell you what this is, I'm just um, one last thing to demonstrate the glamour of glaciology. And um, with that, I'm going to close my window and hopefully you guys have some questions. Yes, it sounds like it sounds like you're underwater. If you turn your sound off, Jesse, there might be a way that I can communicate with the teachers directly. Okay. If any teachers are out there, um, if you put a question in the chat, I'd be happy to answer. Or if Jesse, if you get questions that you want to ask me, um, then maybe we can do it that way. Okay, I'm going to assume Jesse said, answer the questions in the chat. We'll just guess that. Okay, so we've got a question. How long have you been doing this? Right, I've been, I've been working on glaciers for about 15 years now. So I started in my undergraduate where I got to go to Iceland on a field expedition. Um, are you okay with me carrying on, Jesse? Okay. I have no idea what you're saying. Okay, Jesse, if you want to communicate, maybe if you can write in the chat and then I'll see um, see what you're saying. Okay, so um, 15 years on glaciers and um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to work in Greenland, in various places in the Arctic, Canadian high Arctic as well, and in the Antarctic. So I've been doing this quite a while and I'm looking forward to other places that I can go and visit. Um, have I ever gone down in a hole myself? I have gone down maybe about three meters into a hole and then I got scared and came out again because I didn't have the right equipment and I decided it was a silly idea. I wouldn't go much further than that. It's, it's, you have to have very, very specific climbing expertise and mountaineering expertise to be able to do that. And some people can do it safely, but these holes terrify me. I don't think I really want to go down one at any point. Have I ever gotten stuck or had serious injuries? Um, no, actually, no, I've been very lucky so far. No serious injuries. And um, yeah, hopefully that continues. And yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of safety procedures when we go on glaciers as well. We try and do things very safely and avoid any injury. I've got very cold before. I've had hypothermia before, but that's, that's about as serious as it's got for me. Um, okay, so we have, what was the high spikes in the drilling graph? Oh, very good question. So the really high one was a, a thunderstorm. So we were drilling our second borehole and this storm cloud came in. And normally you don't get rain on glaciers, but this was bizarre. It was this absolutely massive rainstorm. Uh, we had to hide under a tarp because the, the rain and the hail was just so intense. It was pretty scary actually being, because you're very, very exposed. And it's, you know, you're, you're so high up in the mountains that it, there is danger of getting hit by lightning. And of course, you've got this drill rig there, which is essentially a giant metal pole sticking up into the air. So it was a bit nerve wracking, but it gave us really cool data because as that rain went into the subglacial system, it flowed through pretty quickly and gave that really, really high spike. 
So because we know exactly when that rainstorm storm started, we can then figure out how long it takes that water to get through the system and how easy or difficult it is for that water to flow. So it was actually really lucky that we managed to catch that at the time, as scary as it was. Um, what, ooh, that's probably actually one of the most dangerous situations I've been in. There's another, um, another question there. Uh, hypothermia is pretty scary as well if you're if you're in the middle of nowhere um, and you've got to be very careful about holes in the ice and cracks and crevasses so I have stuck my foot down a couple of crevasses and that scared me a lot but we're we're roped up so we're attached to other people we're never wandering around on our own not attached to a rope so um, and we've got a lot of training on how to get out of them as well but it's much better to avoid sticking your foot in them if you possibly can is it fresh water yes Yes, so glacier water is fresh water. And so that's actually a really good question because one of the other reasons we're very interested in glaciers is that particularly in the Yukon and the Rockies and the Himalayas, um, these glaciers are sources of fresh water for people. It's where we get our drinking water from. So once you get rid of the glaciers, you don't have that fresh water anymore. It's mixed in with the ocean, it's now all salty. So another reason why we need to see how that's going to change over time so that people can look at other ways to access fresh water. What is the most important thing I've learned working in Antarctica? I think the most important thing I learned um, was from those radar lines that we were dragging across the ice. What we discovered was there was a big hole in the bottom of the ice shelf that's been carved out by the ocean. So it's also a channel, but it's, in the in between the ocean and the ice shelf. And we discovered that because of those channels, those big holes in the ice, you can crack it a lot easier. So we found some more cracks in that ice shelf. And it turns out that's a really important aspect all around the Antarctic. So the more you're melting with the, the ocean, the easier it is to crack the ice. So that's the most important thing I've found there so far. Uh, the temperature of that water, which you, which water? I don't know which water. The temperature of the water going into the glacier um, in the Yukon will be just, just above freezing. In the Antarctic, the temperature of the ocean water could be a little bit below freezing. So it could be minus one degree or minus two degrees because there's salt. So that stops it freezing. So you do not want to fall in there. It'd be very, very chilly. How does scientific method come into play in your research? So that's a great question about how we go about doing this research. And the most important thing about scientific method is that it's repeatable. So if we're looking at models or if we're looking at satellite data um, or we're collecting data on the ground like with that radar, somebody else should be able to go along, collect the same data and come back with the same answer. So we need it to be, you know, if, if somebody else looks at my borehole data, that they need to be able to say, okay, yes, that makes sense. That's correct. We all agree what's causing that. And I mean, sometimes it's difficult. You can't drill a borehole in the same place twice. Some things change quite fast over time. And so it's really important for us to report everything as clearly as possible in scientific literature so people know exactly how we've gone about our methods. The coldest temperature that I've experienced was probably on Devon Island ice cap. So this is in the Canadian high Arctic and it was about minus 48 with wind chill. That was the time that I got hypothermia. I wasn't well enough dressed. We were driving on skidoos and so there was a lot of wind chill added on from that and I got very, very cold. So, I mean, ironically, being a glaciologist, I actually don't have very good circulation. So my hands get cold really quickly, which means I probably should have gone into volcanoes instead, but oh well, too late now. Um, but it means I've got to be quite careful about keeping warm enough in these conditions. The longest expedition I've been on um, was eight weeks camping on the Greenland ice sheet. So you're, you're living in tents, you're 70 kilometers from land, you have no showers, you have no facilities to speak of. It's, you know, it's a very bizarre lifestyle living there for two full months. And when you come back onto land, the first thing that I noticed was, was how green everything smells. So you can smell the flowers and the grass and you don't have any of that on the ice sheet at all. So it was pretty spectacular, you know, just changing from one environment to the other and feeling the warmth of the sun a lot more. I mean, it, it was, it was really quite an experience spending that amount of time. I don't know if I'd want to do that too often now, but when I was a bit younger and doing my PhD, that was, um, that was really fun. How did I come to love ice? 
Well, so that actually um, dates back to when I was an undergraduate and this Iceland field trip that I was talking about. So we went as a class to Iceland and uh, 